Good morning. Welcome to Grace United Methodist Church. We are glad. We are glad and excited that you have chosen to be here and worship today. And we hope that you have felt welcome in coming into this place today. A few announcements that I do want to point out to us. Um, number one is if you will take time um, to look inside your order of worship and read, you can find everything that's going on in the life of the church. And if that's not enough for you, there's a newsletter out there. And even more, there's a web page you can go check out that is updated. And, um, and we try to, our best to keep that updated and as much fresh information as possible on there. So you can always know what's going on in the life of the church. But a few things I do want to point out is that uh, the trustees, if you're a part of the trustees committee, they're meeting um, immediately after the service today. And so they ask that you be there. And uh, Mike said he, the meeting will be about 10 minutes long, so you won't be late for lunch. All right? Um, and there is a chairperson and committee training today at 2 p.m. And what that means is that if you chair a committee or if you are a part of the committee, in other words, if I've called you and said, hey, would you serve on a committee and you said, yeah, then you're on it, we need you to be here at 2 o'clock. It's a setup meeting. It is a, um, just kind of getting us looking ahead, looking forward into the year 2014 and even some years ahead, but um, especially 2014 and thinking, you know, what are we going to be doing in the life of the church this year? And then if you are a part of the finance, finance committee is meeting at 3 today and church council is meeting at 4.15. And so if you are a part of any of those committees, we ask that you take seriously your um, obligation and your commitment to serve and be here. And then the final thing is the last Sunday of this month, January the 26th, we will be um, having Grace on Wheels. Grace on Wheels is a mission project of, of Grace United Methodist Church. Where we go, we take food to folks in the community, and we invite you and encourage you to be a part of this mission opportunity of Grace. And we welcome you to Grace United Methodist Church. Um, our... our, our mission, our vision is to make disciples of Jesus Christ. That's why we exist. And we believe we best do that through worship, missions, Christian education, and youth and children's ministries. And now I invite you to stand as we join together in worshiping and singing this morning with our opening song. Morning. We're going to sing an old-fashioned hymn this morning.
Let's pray. Lord, have mercy on us, for we are sinners, Lord. Thank you for letting us be here today in your house uh, as we try to lift up the name of Jesus. Thank you for blessing this church in many ways that you have, Lord, the Sunday school that we have, the Bible studies, the fellowship meals, the fundraisers, the worship services that we have, Lord. We just pray for your glory. We'd uh, remain in this place and that this ground would be holy and that we could, uh, as we come together, it could be uh, for Jesus' name that we could continue to lift him up and uh, try to be obedient to your word, Lord. Thank you for the praise team, Lord, for um, the efforts they give and the talent you give them and uh, for the words they sing, Lord, I pray that we could take them to heart and uh, and be blessed uh, through them. Thank you for Jason, Lord, for uh, his love for Jesus. Uh, please continue to bless him and his family. And um, may the words that he brings us today uh, touch our hearts and uh, bless us, Lord. Pray for uh, anyone here today, Lord, who may not know, uh, truly know Jesus as a Savior, that you would knock on the door of their heart, Lord. Give them courage to open that door to uh, receive uh, the new life that uh, you have to offer for us. For it truly is worth more than any amount of gold, Lord. And we thank you for that peace and the joy that comes from knowing Jesus as a personal Lord and Savior. Uh, Lord, bless our prayer that you taught us to pray. Uh, our Heavenly Father, our heart in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. While you're up, I invite us all to, to join together with the Apostles' Creed. In the Apostles' Creed, we say it every Sunday. And and in saying it, we remind ourselves the essential truths of the Christian faith. And it's good to remind ourselves of these basic and essential truths. And, and in reminding ourselves of these things, we go out into the world and we proclaim to the world who the hope and salvation of the world is in Jesus Christ by the way that we live and what we believe. And so let us join together with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. While you're up, take a moment, greet those around you, welcome them to grace.
sorrows like sea billows roll. Whatever my love, you have taught me to say, it is well. The trunk shall be sound and the Lord shall be sent. Even so, it is well with my soul. be seated. At this time, let us continue worshiping God as we have this privilege and this opportunity to give back to God. And I hope that as we take this time, that, that we consider it truly what it is. It is worship.
is considering all that God has blessed us with and, and giving to us and giving back to God and giving a portion of God's tithe and our offering and saying, God, here it is. Not just my money, but here I am. And I, I'm asking God that you would take my money, that you would take me, and that you would use me to further your kingdom. That's what this time is about, giving of ourselves. And so let us remember every week as we remind ourselves of this truth, we are never more like God than when we are giving. Let's pray together. God, your goodness and your grace has been poured out on us. Lord, for your grace and for your goodness that's been poured out on us, we, th we say thank you. God, we say we love you. Lord, let what we do now be a visual of how we say thank you and how we say we love you. Lord, don't let our thanks and don't let our love just be lip service. Let it be shown in how we respond. How we live out our life. So God, this time as we have this privilege to give back. With all that is received this day, we pray that through the power of your Holy Spirit, that everything received will be multiplied. And Lord, that more and more people will hear of the good news of Jesus Christ because of how Grace United Methodist Church gives. And let us become more and more like you, our Lord and Savior, because of how we give. in my living air in my breathing God in my waking God in my sleeping God in my resting air in my working God in my waiting God in my speaking be my everything
stand for the doxology? <laughs> Our scripture this morning is from 2 Corinthians 5, verses 16 through 20. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to him through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. See, you got rednecks, then you have river rats. So I'm reading over in Romans chapter 12, be good to your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, do not return evil for evil, River rats tend to be far better thieves than your just local rednecks. You be good to them and don't return evil for evil. I was fishing for a living. It's my livelihood. I'm working my tail off. They're hungry, feed them. These river rats would, would steal my fish. I'd caught several of them before then. Usually I'd just come up, roar out there, come up with my shotgun and said, the next person who moves dies. They're stealing my fish here, Lord. They're hungry, feed them. And you want me to do what? Do not return evil for evil. Well, I have to see if that will work, but it makes no earthly sense, that's for sure. So one day I heard a motor slow down. These guys, pull over to my, to my float and I'm watching them through the bushes. So I said, I'm gonna be good to them, but I'm carrying my gun just in case. They're not good to me. And I'm gonna do what the Lord said. I'm gonna be good to them. So I roar up on them and they're getting my net almost up in their boat and they look up and they see this guy coming. they be me, wide open. I said, what were you boys doing with that net? And they said, oh, is that what that was? I said, yeah that be a hook neck. It belongs to me. I said, here's the good news. I'm going to raise the net, and whatever's in there, I'm going to give them to you. And when I said that, they looked at each other, and they said, they left me looking back, and all of a sudden, up and down the river, they quit stealing my fish. I just gave them what they were trying to steal. I took that to mean God was right all along. Last week we began a series, and the title of the series is Weird, and here's the whole premise and point of this series is that 
oftentimes, especially at the first of the year, toward the beginning of the new year, we make these resolutions. We say, I'm going to resolve to do this or I will do this. And by the end of January, at best, by the mid-February, it's completely uh, compromised, if not just done away with. And, and the problem is, it's not necessarily making a resolution and saying, I'm going to live differently when it comes to whatever we want to say a resolution about in our life. I think the problem is that we're still living normal. And living normal doesn't change anything. In fact, if you think back about your life or across your life this past year, just this past year, not even the years before, just this past year, and if nothing's changed in your life, I would probably challenge us all to consider, and I say us all because I'm, cons- I'm putting myself in this bracket of people too, if nothing has really changed in your life that you wanted to see change in your life this past year, it's probably because we're still living normal and not living weird. And here's the whole point of this whole normal versus weird deal is that Jesus really is probably the most weird person you will ever come across. You might not like to hear those words, Jesus and weird, together in the same sentence, but it is what it is. Jesus was weird. Read the Gospels and the things that Jesus is attributed to saying. He's weird. He's weird because he doesn't go with the flow of what the world says things should be and how the world says you should be yourself in your life, how you live about life. And so last week we began thinking about what it is to be weird and and we set it up into into a four-week series and we began last week talking about finances. And today we're going to talk about relationships. Next week we're going to talk about intimacy. Call your friends. Say, hey, Jason's going to be talking about intimacy. You need to be here. I'm just saying. And then the following week, we're going to talk about values. But today, relationships. And relationships are something that, that every one of us have. And in fact, these four areas that we're talking about over these four weeks, every one of us have to deal with these four areas in some way, somehow, some fashion. But today, relationships. And when it comes to relationships, we have a variety of relationships. We have relationships with people that we like to be around, that we, we hope that we will get to see them pretty frequent. We have relationships with people that we don't really care if we see them or not. Just in all honesty. We have relationships with people that we love and we know they love us back. We have relationships with folks that cannot stand us. And in the midst of them cannot being able to stand us, we still have this call from Jesus that if you're going to follow me, then I need you to love them even if they can't stand you, even if they are your enemy and they hate you. You should love them. So as we think about weird relationships today, let's just kind of jump right in. We have those people in our life, whether it be family, whether it be friends, whatever it may be that we love, we love dearly. We will do for them anything that is is possible, earthly possible, we would do for them. We would give them the shirt off our back, so to speak. We would go the extra mile for them. We would just lay it all down and do any selfless act possible for these folks. And then we have relationships with people that we really don't care for. And we know they don't really care for us either. And that's, that's cool because it's a two-way street, baby. You don't like me, I don't like you, hey. But in the midst of those relationships, what if? What if the people who put you down, the people who betray you, the people who reject you, the people who hate you, the people who take from you, what if Jesus says, I want you to love them the same way you love the ones who are closest to you? Because really, that's what Jesus has called us to. And that's weird. Because normally, as you do to me, and I'm going to do the same thing to you, if not even worse. And Jesus says, that's normal. What's weird? Weird is treating others the way God would treat them. And in our mind, we can justify and say, well, I know how God would treat them. He would rain down hell and judgment on them. I know exactly what God would do. And then we probably need to reconsider and say, no. And I think we we would reconsider when we actually look at the Gospels and look what Jesus did. We would know exactly how God would treat others. This past week, as I was getting these thoughts and reading these passages of scripture that we're going to read in a moment, reading them again and again and again, and and trying to get thoughts on the paper and just trying to get some type of something together. I got to be honest, I don't like this. Just throwing it out there. I don't like it. What 
what Jesus has to say about these situations of retaliation and love, it's not very convenient. And as I was doing preparation for today, I thought of several folks. Well, yeah, I guess I need to love them a little better. I thought of someone who I had called friend, who betrayed me, who used me, who said, I love you, but turns back on me. Manipulative. And the normal side of Jason, the normal side of Jason wants to expose this person for all this person is. He said, let me tell you. Let me tell you how rotten and sleazy this person can be. And in doing that, all it would do was bring harm on them. And maybe for a little while make me feel a little bit better. But at the end of the day, it wouldn't fix anything. But the weird, the weird part of it, the living weird part of it, is to treat this person the way God would treat them. So today as we begin to think about relationships, let's just move past, if we can, let's just move past the relationships that everything's hunky-dory. If you don't know what hunky-dory means, it means you're probably a lot younger than I am. Just ask somebody sitting next to you if they're older. If they have gray hair, they probably know what hunky-dory hunky is. Everything's peachy good and perfect, okay? If everything's hunky-dory in relationships, let's just move past those. Let's think about the ones that just stink, all right? The ones with people in them you can't really stand, and they can't stand you. Let's think about those. Because we begin to think about those, the ones where people have done us wrong, they've, they, they've talked bad about us, they've wronged you, they've embarrassed you, they've insulted you, they've betrayed you, they've hurt you. The question, the thought is then, how did you respond? And in responding to them, how did you treat them? And in how you treat them, let's think about it this way. If somebody says their name, what are the things that come to your mind? Are they, uh, or are they, I love you? Because when we begin to process how we treat others who hurt us, wrong us, betray us, embarrass us, insult us, we begin to process how we treat those folks, how we respond to those folks. It says a lot about where we are in our relationship with God. I'm just being honest. Because living weird is treating others the way God would treat them. And here's what I know that we we find ourselves doing. When, When we have people hurt us, we have people wrong us, betray us, reject us, embarrass us, insult us, what we tend to do is we tend to seek out other folks. Well, I need to talk to you. Okay, what what about? Well, this happened. This person did this. This person said this. and, And here's what I know, because I'm guilty of it. I go talk to the people who think just like I do. That way when they say, you should say this, you should do this, that's the same thing I was thinking. I'm justifying it. And you know what happens in the end, what that's really about? That's really about people pleasing and not God pleasing because I would imagine that if it goes against treating them the way God would treat them, then you've already made an idol by going to search out someone else's response instead of looking at how God says respond. And God says, I don't want you to do the normal thing because the normal thing doesn't work. Normal retaliation, revenge, doesn't change. Your life doesn't change. Their life doesn't change anyone's life for the better. So when it comes to all of your relationships, when it comes to relationships with your family, your friends, your enemies, and maybe your enemies are wrapped up into your family and friends, I don't know. But when it comes to these folks, how are you treating them? Because the weirdest person I've ever known says that we should treat them with love and not to retaliate. In other words, to treat them the way God would treat them. And the weirdest person I've ever known, his name is Jesus. 
if you have your Bibles, I want, I want you to turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5. We're going to pick up in verse 38. And as you're turning over there, as it's now already on the screen, just a reminder about this portion of Scripture that we're in. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. And Matthew records it for us probably better than any of the other Gospel writers. Luke alludes to it, but Matthew just really nails it. And Jesus is talking, and he's not just talking to everybody. In the Sermon on the Mount, it's best to be understood is is Jesus is talking to folks who have said, I want to follow after this man, Jesus. I want him to be the Lord of my life. In other words, to put it in our terminology or our vernacular or whatever, is I want to be a disciple of Jesus. And so Jesus says, if you want to be a disciple of me, this is what it looks like. So the implication then is this, that if you're not a follower of Jesus, you're off the hook in terms of your living your life this way, just saying. But if you say, I love Jesus and I want to follow Jesus, then Jesus says, this is what your life should look like. And this is the part I'm about to read that I told you a few minutes ago I'm not crazy about. But I know that if I want to love Jesus and follow Jesus and be Jesus to people in this world, this is what my life has to look like. You have heard that it was said, the normal way of thinking. You've heard it said. You grew up with it. Your mom and daddy told you. Your grandparents told you. Your friends told you. It's what society expects. It's what culture demands of you. You've heard it said, Jesus said. You've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, not the normal you've heard it said, but I say, the weird part. You ready? Because it, it'll rock your world. Jesus says, but I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. And if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. Let's stop right there. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. Now when Jesus begins, he says, you know, you've heard it said, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. He's quoting from the Old Testament. Hands down, he is. He's quoting from the Old Testament from passages in Exodus, passages in Leviticus, passages in Deuteronomy. He says, you've heard it said. You were given this law as as part of what's called the law of retribution. It was the best way you could work out in and of yourselves as people of God, you could work it out the best in and of yourselves that if, if someone does this to you in your property, then the law of retribution says you do the exact same thing to them. But throughout time, what has happened is that it's, just, it's not just been that. You've gone on to, I'm going to do what you did to me exactly and then some. I'm going to do what you did exactly to me and then some plus financial reimbursement. In other words, you poke out my right eye or you poke me in my right eye, I'm going to poke you in your right eye. And because you poke me in my right eye, you're also going to pay my doctor bills and my time away from work. Now, I for not two for two. And Jesus says, No. Don't retaliate. Don't retaliate. And let's keep this in mind. Jesus isn't taking away, defend yourself. Just throw that out there for free. What he is taking away is he is taking away retaliation. He's taking it off the table. If someone does you wrong, don't resist it. And then he goes on to say, if someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. Now, let's think about this. Here's me, all right? Right arm, we got it. Right, left, right, left. Now, if I were to strike somebody on the right cheek that's facing me, which hand would I use? like I'm a tennis left but 90% of the population is what right hand so what Jesus is speaking against in this is not necessarily a physical hit he's talking about embarrassment and insulting because in that culture and still today in that culture a backhand because 90% of the population is right-handed, and to be hit on the right side first and then to turn the other cheek means that you have been backhanded 
If you have been embarrassed and insulted, either publicly or privately, then Jesus says, if you've been embarrassed and insulted, turn the cheek. Just let it go. Don't retaliate. Huh. And then he doesn't stop. I told you I don't like this. He says, and if anyone wants to sue you, they want to take your coat. Don't stop there. You want my coat? Huh? Let me get you my cloak as well. Let me get you the more expensive outer garment that I have. It looks good with the coat, I promise. The cloak, the coat together, perfect match. You can have it. And we're thinking, no, you're not going to take that. I'm going to fight you for it, and you ain't getting a dime I got. And Jesus says, give them your cloak as well. And then he goes on. He says, and if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. Now, that you probably think, what the world is he talking about? What, what, Jesus, what do you mean? In, in that culture, in that time, it was nothing for Roman soldiers and Ro Roman government officials to take Jews, oppress them, to, to force labor out of them, somewhat as slaves. So here, carry this whatever for me for a mile and Jesus says if that's you if someone says they force you to go one mile Jesus says don't stop there it's like can I go two with you also so how does that relate to your life someone who mistreats you uses you abuses you manipulates you Jesus says why not go another mile and then he says give to everyone who begs from you and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. Did I tell you I didn't like this? Last week was a little bit better with the whole finances deal. Ten to the church, ten and savings, live off of 80. I'm good with that. But this, Jesus, you're kind of getting personal. You don't understand what they did to me. You don't understand what they said to me. You don't understand how they treated me. You don't understand how they embarrassed me. You don't understand how they made me feel. And Jesus didn't stop there. Mr. Weird kept on going with more of his you've heard it said, but I say stuff. Look at verse 43. You have heard that it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Maybe you're thinking, where did that come about? Well, over in the Old Testament, they had the command, love your neighbor as yourself. And throughout time, the implication for, for the Israelites, God's people was, we love our neighbor. That means we hate our enemy. They do wrong to us, we do wrong to them. You remember, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. You missed it. But I say to you, the weird thing, not the normal thing, the weird thing is to not only love the ones who love you, but love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now, this love thing that Jesus is talking about is not some sentimental love. Jesus is what he's talking about with love is that I'm choosing the good for my enemies. I'm choosing to do good for the ones who want nothing but bad for me. <laughs> I don't like it. And then he goes on. He says, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. And what that says is that when you love your enemies, when you begin to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, what you're really finding out is that you're really becoming and finding out that you are more and more a child of God. And this child and this God, he's the one who makes the sun rise on both the evil and the good. He sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. So here's the deal. He loves you all the same. We got that? He loves us all the same. So how can we treat others the way God would treat them for if you love those who love you what reward do you have don't do not even the tax collectors do the same i love how the message paraphrase of this passage says that it says any run of the mill sinner can do that anybody can love the ones who love you and and, and what good is that and jesus goes on and if you greet only your brothers and sisters what more are you doing than others Again, any run-of-the-mill sinner does that. But be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. 
And this whole idea of perfection is not this moral perfection that I never do anything wrong. This whole idea of perfection that Jesus is talking about is being made perfect in love with God and in love with one another. And it's, this, it's, these passages and these words from Jesus are really a reminder to us that if we say we love God and we don't love other people, even the people who hate us and our enemies, we really are not in love with God. And so Jesus says that if you're going to follow me, you're going to have to live weird. Retaliation, that's off the table. What makes you think you deserve the right? Just because somebody wronged you? You don't have any rights, really, other than to surrender to Jesus. And when it comes to loving others, just to say that, that, that you love people who love you, what, what good is that? What difference is that going to make? Anybody can do that. But if you want to make a difference, if you want to see this community change, if you want to see this church change, if you want to see this world change, where it starts is not retaliating, where it starts is loving all people, even your enemies. It's really, it really is living weird. And living weird in our relationships is treating others the way God would treat them. And so as you think back on your relationships, as you think back just this past year, not years ahead, but just this past year on your relationships, as you consider those, as you consider the people who just really get to you, who are your enemies, who frustrate you, who hate you, who have wronged you, who have insulted you, who have hurt you, who have embarrassed you. As you think about these people, as you can put names with faces, and you can probably make a list and check it twice and know you've got every one of them. Jesus says, don't retaliate and love them and pray for them. And that will lead to a weird relationship. But if it hasn't changed how you view these folks over the past year, then you're probably still living normal. And, and as tough as these words are from Jesus, living normal won't cut it. Jesus calls us to something more. Jesus calls us to live differently. Jesus calls us to change the world, and we begin by changing the world and how we treat other people. And are we treating them the way God would treat them? And again, we would definitely, we can find passages, and we can use passages to justify how we feel. Well, God would treat them this way. You read this passage, and I say, well, hold on a second. Let's go back and let's look at what Jesus did. If you want to know how God would treat somebody, look how Jesus treated them. And if we want to understand what Jesus meant by what Jesus said in these passages, let's read the Gospels and let's look at what Jesus did. And we will have a clear view of how God would treat others. But Jesus, you don't understand. Yeah. He does. You don't know what it's like. You don't know what it's like to be rejected. You don't know what it's like to be betrayed. You don't know what it's like to be embarrassed. You don't know what it's like to have someone turn their back on you who says they love you. Jesus, you have no idea. And Jesus says, oh, well, yeah, I do. Because let me tell you what's weird. What's weird is Jesus dying for you and for me. And for this whole God-hating world, that's weird. Jesus dying. As the Apostle Paul puts it, Jesus dying for you while we were yet his enemies. Jesus died. And what else is weird? Because, you know, we say, Jesus, you don't understand. But all these words that Jesus said, Jesus lived out. One example is when Jesus is in the garden praying with his disciples. And Judas, the one who we recognize as betraying, even though really all the disciples betrayed him, but one who betrayed him, came and met him in the garden with a kiss, and Jesus says, hey, friend, 
the one who betrayed him, he still called him a friend. We remember in that scene, too, Peter's view of retaliation of pulling the sword and chopping off the ear. And Jesus says, put your sword away, man. He picks up the ear and he puts it back on the head of Malchus. Now, that's weird, but that's love. So don't nobody want to go around missing an ear. So, so Jesus treated them the way God wanted them to be treated. So what about the whole turn the other cheek deal, Jesus? Oh, yeah. Later in the Gospel of Matthew, around chapter 26, it talks about Jesus being backhanded and called a blasphemer. He knows exactly what it's like to be embarrassed and insulted, to be spat upon. He knows what it's like to be hanging on the cross dying and to pray, Father, forgive them because they ain't got a clue what they're doing. He knows what it's like to be hanging there on the cross dying and having two criminals beside you. If you read all four Gospels, you'll see that both of them at one point in time were hurling insults at Jesus. And then finally in the Gospel of Luke, you'll see where one comes to his senses. And he says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. You know, Jesus didn't say, dude, I ain't remembering you. You was talking about me bad a while ago. I don't forget that. I got a memory like an elephant. Oh, I may forgive you, but I won't forget you. Jesus didn't say all that. He said, you know what he said? Today you will be with me in paradise. And that's weird. And the beauty of it is Jesus hasn't called us to do anything that he himself has not done already. And you still may be thinking, but I'm not Jesus. And I would probably say, you're right. I'm not either. But we've been called to be like Jesus. But I can't do that. And I'll say, yeah, you can. But I'm not Jesus. Well, there's another dude named Stephen in the book of Acts who did the same thing as he was being stoned to death. He prayed for the forgiveness of those who were killing him. And so I say all that to say is you're probably wondering, what's the importance of this, Jason? Why? I mean, you've you got to tell me more than just Jesus said so. Why? Because as the church, as people who say, I want to follow you, Jesus, but as the church, we've been given the command, the mission to go and make disciples. And if we're going to go and make disciples... We've got to live weird. And that's going to mean treating others the way God would treat them. Because if you are a follower of Jesus Christ this day, let me tell you what attracted you to Jesus, is that he loved you in spite of who you have been and in spite of the worst that you can be, he still loves you. That's what attracted you to Jesus. And if it's our job as the church to bring people to Jesus, the only way that we can do that is by loving them and by treating them the way God would treat them. So how are you treating others? How are your relationships? Are they normal? If they are, nothing's changing, I'm sure. If they're weird, there's going to be some fun ahead. It's not easy, but it's going to make a huge difference. Living weird is treating others the way God would treat them. Let's pray together. God, your love is beyond our understanding. And even on our best days, if we're honest, we can think, Lord, have mercy. Why? <laughs> Why would you love me as much as you do? But Lord, when we're even at our worst, you love us. And you call us to represent you to be about a ministry of reconciliation to not retaliate to not bring revenge to not hate our enemies but to love so God let our relationships get weird let us take serious the name of Jesus because it's the name of Jesus that brings salvation it's the name of Jesus that brings hope may our lives and how, and how we treat others and all of our relationships speak loudly the name of Jesus not just with our mouth but how we live 
because if our lives don't line up with what we say, we're wasting our time. May how we live and how we treat others be weird. May it be how you would treat others. Amen.
name of Jesus that brings healing, that brings hope. The way that we live our lives is the name of Jesus being lived out. More specifically in how we treat others is the name of Jesus being lived out. I invite you to stand and to receive the benediction that is ours. As you go today, go in the love, go in the peace of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. May we live weird as we treat others the way God would treat them. Amen. Reach over, grab the hand of that weird person standing next to you. Find